Well, good morning, everybody. That was a really nice surprise today. Um, we love, Leah and I love you all so much, and we just love uh, getting to be a part of what God's doing at City Life together with all of you. And so thank you for uh, the appreciation um, right back at you. What a privilege it is to be a part of this church and the great mission that God has given to us. Well, we are in a series we're calling All the Feels, and I want to welcome you if you're a guest, if you're joining us online. This is week number three, and what we've been doing is really exploring how we can manage our emotions and our feelings in a biblical way, in a healthy way. And so we started a couple weeks ago with the feeling of overwhelm. What do you do when you just feel overwhelmed? By life. And last week we talked about seasons of sadness in our lives and the role that sadness can play in our lives. Sadness actually is a gift from God to be able to grieve and process uh, disappointment in our lives. And so we looked at that last week. And today I want to pick it up with a feeling that can be powerfully constructive or powerfully destructive, depending on how it's channeled. And that is anger. So I want to ask you a question, what do you do when you get angry? What do you do when you get angry? They say there are some different ways that we uh, respond to anger. Some people are spewers, some people are stuffers, and some people are leakers when it comes to anger. What are you? What do you do when you get angry? I saw another author, he put it in geographic terms, and he said, where do you go when you get angry? Do you go to Mount St. Helens? Do you go to a volcano? Is that kind of what you turn into when you get angry? Some of us are like a volcano that, you know, you just can't keep it inside anymore. Pity the fool that triggers you at the wrong time, at the wrong moment. You just kind of explode. Some of us are like a crock pot or a boiling, you know, some boiling water on the stove that you just turn it on and it's just simmering, simmering, simmering until it just gets to a boiling point and now everybody and everything around you gets cooked. That you might be like that, a volcano, when you get angry. Where do you go? Some of us, we go to Iceland. And this one is a little bit more passive aggressive than the volcano. But you just kind of give everybody the cold shoulder. You just kind of start freezing people out. You know, we look at the volcano people. They're, they're so unspiritual. But the spiritual people with their anger, they go to Iceland. And, you know, you don't, you don't blow up on people. You just kind of nitpick people all day, maybe, when you get angry. You know, you become a little sarcastic, a little defensive. And, and we, can, we can just start, we can just kind of start freezing people out of our lives. And then some of you, maybe you go to this third one. You go to the Sahara Desert when you get angry. You just kind of disconnect and isolate yourselves. You know, I think some of us, we grew up in families that didn't really display emotion. And so we kind of picked up and learned that if you're feeling something deeply, you just, man, try to ignore it, just try to stuff it inside. And so we end up tiptoeing around emotions and tiptoeing around conflict and ignoring that stuff that's going on. But what happens if you internalize everything is that uh, it becomes, it's almost like a 50-gallon drum of poison that's sitting in your soul with a little hole at the bottom of it, just leaking out day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, until your emotional system just collapses one day. You know, counselors will say that depression is often anger toward, turned inward. It's anger that we internalize and we don't know how to, how to process it in a healthy way and so we, it gets turned inward and we experience all kinds of unhealthy things as a result of that. And so what we want to do today is learn how to deal with our anger in a healthier way. Whether you have a short fuse or a long fuse, all of us deal with anger. And so I want to take you to Psalm chapter 4. We've been studying the Psalms in this series. They're so real, so raw. And Psalm 4 is a a beautiful psalm, eight verses long, and so we're going to study it this morning. But here, here's how it starts in verse one, written by King David. And he says, answer me when I call to you, O God who declares me innocent, free me from my troubles, have mercy on me, and hear my prayer. And one of the things we've been learning in this series is how important prayer is when it comes to processing our feelings in a healthy way. And just to give you a little review, three things we've been learning about feelings. Number one is that feelings have a purpose. Feelings are an amazing uh, guy, uh, a gauge. They're kind of like a GPS, GPS system for the soul. 
that whenever you begin to feel something, if you will follow the trail of that jealousy, that bitterness, that disappointment, that anger, it'll always take you somewhere to something that God wants to touch, that God wants to deal with. And so that's the purpose of our feelings. They're a gauge. And then number two, we've learned that feelings are not facts. Your feelings will lie to you. Have you figured that out? And so we've got to recognize that while feelings are a wonderful gauge, they're a horrible guide. And if we're going to be led through life by our feelings, we're going to be all over the place, up and down. And so we want to learn to live beyond our emotions. But then number three, and the only way we do that is to recognize our feelings have to surface. We have to bring our feelings in healthy ways to the surface of our lives. And that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. And, and that's why prayer is so powerful because prayer is the environment in which we can come into the presence of God and process our emotions because unprocessed emotions don't die, they just get buried alive. And then they force their way out in other unhealthy ways. And so I, I want to just kind of at the beginning of the message, I'm going to introduce you to somebody actually and share a resource with you because I think the reality is we need help with this at times. At times when our feelings and our emotional health and our mental health is at a place of stress, we need somebody to help us who's gifted, who's trained to be able to get some of this to the surface. And so I want to welcome somebody who's become a great, great friend of our church, Maria Greco, out here to the stage. Would you give a really warm City Life welcome, everybody, to Maria? Thank you. (laughs) Maria, thanks so much for uh, hanging with us today. Maria is the executive director of CCM. Uh, Cornerstone Counseling Ministries, and CCM is based out of Easton, Pennsylvania, but God has been expanding their ministry, and they wanted to open a second location here in Philadelphia, and so here's the great news, if you haven't, if you didn't know this yet, is that that location has opened right here in our building, and so we've been able to, yeah, become an extension of CCM to Philadelphia. And I wanted you to meet Maria because it's an amazing resource we have right here. There's an amazing discount that is being offered to everybody who is a part of our church, referred to uh, by somebody in our church. And uh, we're actually setting aside money as well as a church from your Kingdom Builders giving to help, in addition to that, just make counseling accessible to people. But share with us a little bit, Maria, because, you know, I think we've all experienced this global pandemic together. And how have you seen just the events in our world and our, uh, impacting people's mental health? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's great to be here. Um, but, you know, we've seen an increase in anxiety and depression, um, suicidal thoughts, divorce, abuse addictions, right? Like, that's been happening all over. Uh, and I think prior to the pandemic, it was maybe a little bit easier to, to mask a little bit of that. Maybe we're doing the, what you're talking about with anger, kind of stuffing it down or, or letting it simmer. Um, but then we get placed in a lockdown, right? And you're at home 24 seven with your mm. whole family and, and life just stops and you're sitting in that silence and that solitude and, and these things are beginning to surface, right? We're, we're experiencing what we were calling collective trauma, um, loneliness and job loss and poverty, um, polarizations, all of these things are stirring. And so what do we do with that? Um, and I can tell you at, at CCM, since the start of the pandemic in, in 2020, we have more than doubled our client caseload. Wow. Um, and that's, you know, partly due, we were able to have, you know, virtual sessions, which is amazing. But I also think people are, are at this point where they're needing help mm-hmm. and they're courageously stepping out and getting that help and support that they need. Um, so at CCM, we're very lucky. We have an amazing team of counselors. And, and to this point, we haven't had to turn anyone away. Um, so we're, we're grateful for that. But that's what we're seeing is people stepping out and saying these things that have been bubbling up, I can't hide them anymore. I need to talk about it. I need to reach out for support. Yeah. And it seems like there's like a spotlight even in our larger culture just on mental health. And we watched at the Olympics a few months ago, Simone Biles, who took herself out of competition because of her mental health. And, you know, one of the things that feels encouraging is that the stigma that was there for a long time feels like it's maybe uh, coming away a bit. But speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I, that is such a great question. I honestly, when I read that about Simone Biles, I was so encouraged. I think 
having, you know, oftentimes in our culture, we, we see someone who has a broken leg, right? Or, or something visible that we can see that they're in pain. And we say, you know, they need to go to the doctor. They need to go to the hospital. They need to rest. They need to have physical therapy afterwards, right? But the mental component of that and the emotional component of that, we often can't see. Mm. So in our minds, you know, are they exaggerating? Are they um, being lazy? Whatever it is, we kind of put these labels on it. Mm. Um, but we're feeling it, right? We're the ones experiencing it too. And so to see someone like Simone Biles, an Olympian, right? Take, take that step back and say, I need to do this for myself, for my team, for wholeness, for health. Um, I just think it's amazing. And I, I do think, and it seems new, right? This seems like a new kind of thing. And maybe in some ways in our American culture, it is new because I think our culture is one that we go hard, we buck up, we do whatever we have to do for our team. Um, and not that all of that's bad, but I think sometimes in doing that, we overlook our mental health and our emotional health and our mm -hmm. spiritual health, um, putting that to the back burner. But as I was thinking about this question earlier, the story came to my mind in First Kings with Elijah, when Elijah was, you know, overworked, overwhelmed, and uh, I would argue probably depressed, um, going through a season of depression. And and what did God say to him, right? It wasn't, buck up, you need to go do this for our people. You got to get out there and keep going hard, hard, hard. Um, he said, Elijah, go take a nap. Um, and then when you wake up, eat. And then go ahead and take another nap. And then when you wake up, go exercise. And, uh, and be in my presence, right? So when we look at those four things, you know, eat, rest, exercise, be in the presence of God, I think he's speaking something to us. I think mm. this is what he's stirring in our weary hearts, right? Um, and I think like you're talking about through the Psalms and Proverbs, there's so much about the wisdom of, of counselors and, and being supported by people who, who can walk alongside of you. Um, so yeah, that's what we want to do. Our, our counselors have studied, you know, studied this for years. They've learned techniques and skills because at one point or another, we were all here, you know, and we need someone to walk with us. And so that's our desire is to just walk with people. Yeah. I know in my life, in my spiritual journey, there have been times I've just been stuck and didn't know how to, you know, fully sort out what I was feeling, what I was experiencing and counseling has been a really pivotal thing for me. For people in our church, maybe who are feeling even in this series, like there's a stirring and they're not exactly sure what to do. How can they connect to CCM and, you know, what, what will that feel like if they make that connection? Yeah, I think first and foremost, um, I just want to say, you know, you're not alone. This is something that we're all dealing with. Um, and it's really, really brave to step out and make that first call. I know it's intimidating. I've, I've been on the other end of that call many times, calling a counselor or sending an email about counseling. Um, but one thing we really try to do at CCM is make it approachable. So we have an amazing administrator. I brag on her all the time, uh, Tanya. So she's at the receiving end of those phone calls and the receiving end of those emails. Uh, she'll guide you through, even if you just have questions about what the process looks like, we're here to help you. You're not ready to jump into counseling yet. That's fine. We're here to help make it accessible, make us, uh, make it approachable. Um, so yeah, there's a team who, who wants to be with you guys through this. Yeah. That's awesome. And you've got even some cool events, some fun events coming up. Maybe that could be a good first step for people. You've got a table in the back. Why don't you talk a little bit about some of those resources? Yes, definitely. We're super excited. So like Pastor Brad said, our, our first location was in the Lehigh Valley. So we're kind of just getting into things here down in South Philly. Uh, but for you city lifers, we are going to be hosting an event November 13th from 9 to 12, and that's called Mud Matters. Uh, so that event is going to be led by Susan Briggs, who's one of our city life counselors, as well as a potter. Uh, so it's just walking through Jeremiah 18 and talking about the great potter and his intention for us, uh, making us the unique vessels that he's created us to be. Um, so that event's coming up. All the information for that is going to be in the back. Susan and I are back there. Um, info on how to sign up, more info about CCM. And Susan's selling some of her mugs and uh, a book that she wrote called Muddy Jane Matters Today. Uh, and the proceeds for that go towards helping clients in need who can't uh, afford counseling. So come by. We'd love to, we'd love to meet you and say hi. Uh, Pastor Brad, City Life you know, team, thank you guys so much for this opportunity today, but also the opportunity for, you know, to use that beautiful room and, and serve people and be in South Philly. We are honored to be a part of this family. So, well, so are we. You. We can't wait to see how God's going to use it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Maria. So I hope that you'll stick around a little bit after the uh, service today. Go and meet 
Susan and Maria, the mugs out there are beautiful. And on the 13th, Mud Matter is going to be a really fun event where you can begin to explore some of this too in a deeper way. Um, as we look back here at Psalm chapter 4, I just want to give you three principles that jump out to me from this psalm, from this chapter, when it comes to processing our anger. And the first one is this, jot this down. Number one, identify your hurt. Identify your hurt. Because anger is really a surface emotion. And where there's heat, there's hurt. When the pot starts simmering and boiling, when the volcano gets ready to erupt, it often is an indication that there is something below the surface. Unresolved hurt, unresolved pain. And so come back here to Psalm chapter 4 with me and look at what David says next in verse 2. How long will you people ruin my reputation? Ever been there? You people. How long will you people be able to do this to me? How long will you make groundless accusations? How long will you continue your lies? Psalm chapter 4 is most likely a companion psalm to Psalm chapter 3. In fact, in Jewish readers, Psalm 3 is called a morning uh, prayer. Psalm 4 is the evening prayer. And we learned a couple weeks ago, we actually studied Psalm 3. David here is running for his life from his son Absalom, who has started a civil war and is trying to take the throne away from him. And so Psalm 4 most likely is written at the same time in his life. And Absalom, who the Bible says was handsome, he had amazing hair, he was really talented. David, you know, it was his favorite son. David saw all of the potential he had. David dreamed of a day that he could hand the kingdom over to Absalom, that he could mentor and develop Absalom. But Absalom wanted nothing to do with his dad. He didn't want to wait for any of it. And so he started working it. He started using his charisma to deceive people. He had a really expensive chariot with impressive horses, so he would drive it around town, you know, and the girls would all turn their heads when the sports car and the guy with the amazing flowing hair came by, and he would sit out at the gate, and people would come by, and he'd put his arm around them, you know, and he would say, hey, you know, I know my dad, David, he isn't out here. He doesn't have time for this. He doesn't really care about you, but good news, you know, I'm going to be king soon. And I'm going to fix everything, you know, tell me your problems. And he started through deception, winning the hearts of the people over to himself and then launched this civil war. And so now David is in the wilderness. He's running for his life. He's being hunted by his own son. He's being hunted by men who he thought would be with him and have his back uh, throughout all the way to the end of his life. And he's hurting. And he's trying to pray, but it's just these guys that keep coming into his mind. He's saying, God, how long are these guys going to get away with this? How long are these guys going to be able to slander me? How long are these guys going to be able to hurt me? And I think this is really important because oftentimes, you know, we just think, well, man, I'm just angry. I'm just angry. And I think especially if I could just with love challenge all of the guys for a minute, I think that we can, you know, sometimes we're comfortable acknowledging, man, I'm just angry. The reality is, you're hurting. You're hurting. And beneath the anger, there's unresolved hurt, unresolved pain. And it may not be as dramatic as David, uh, but there are ways in which we are hurting in our lives, and the manifestation of that is anger. And you know what hurt is? This is just a really simple definition. Hurt is the gap between your expectations and reality. That gap, life is filled with unmet expectation. That gap is hurt. It's pain. And so you expected that they were going to respond this way, and here's how they responded. You expected that you were going to be promoted. Still hasn't happened yet. You expected you'd be on the phone for 15 minutes with AT&T customer service. Still waiting. And so that gap between my expectations And reality creates hurt. It creates pain. And what we do with that, pain with that hurt, matters. Now, I want to kind of create just a a simple distinction here. I think it's an important distinction. When it comes to that gap, we need to distinguish between the hurt and the pain. Where is it coming from? Because we live in a culture today where offense and it's like a national pastime, I feel like, a lot of the time. It's like we wake up in the morning and like, I'm going to go get offended today. 
And I'm just going to be angry today. And we get offended by everybody. We get offended by everything. Uh, my youngest daughter, she came out on the porch this week and somebody in the family said something that she felt like was disrespectful. And so Karis kind of snapped back and she said, I'm offensive. <laughs> Thought, <laughs> I think you meant I'm offended, but a lot of us are walking around throughout the day I'm offended. And because of that, I'm becoming offensive. And we're being offended by everybody and we're offending everybody. And we just need to, with some of this, get a little tougher, to be honest with you. Let some things go a little quicker as we, as we go through life. Because as soon as you let somebody offend you, you let them own you. And now we're unable to stay on mission we're totally distracted from what Jesus has called us to do. And so I do think that there is some of this that we just, man, we just got to let it go. But then there is real hurt and there is real pain that we've experienced in our lives. Maybe because of something that's been done to you, like David, maybe pain that's self-inflicted that you have created for yourself because of your own choices and decisions. And when it comes to that hurt and that pain in our lives, we have got to identify it and name it so that God can heal it. God is a healer. And not only can he heal your body physically, of cancer and arthritis and lupus and autoimmune diseases, and we believe in that. He also wants to heal your heart. Scripture says that he is close to the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. And if that's you today, you're experiencing anger and you don't really know why and you can't get it under control. If it's coming from a place where you have been wounded, God wants to bring his healing touch to your heart. So you gotta identify, and where am I hurting? Where do I need God's healing? And then secondly, here's what I want to give you today is that you need to take control of your anger. Take control of your anger before your anger takes control of you. And so David says in verse four, so important, don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight. There's some great advice. And remain silent. It's great practical advice right there. Don't sin by letting your anger control you, which tells us that not all anger is sin. That there, that there is sin, that, that there is anger that comes, anger, all, all anger, however, can lead to sin. And so what anger always is, is it's a crossroads to determine, how am I going to deal with this? Am I going to be controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me so that the fruit of the Spirit is what comes out? Am I going to respond with love and joy and peace and patience and self-control? Or is the anger going to take control? And that's what leads us into sin. And so I want to, I want to just give you some really practical advice right now. David says, be quiet and just kind of give it a night and think about it. And I want to give you this practical resource that I think is helpful because, you know, some of you are like, Brad, man, this is hard. Like, it's easy for you. You're a pastor. You're literally paid to love people. Like, and, you know, what am I, how am I supposed to do this? Control my anger. This is a really great resource. I've taught this before, but I think it's so helpful. And it's the word snap. We're going to snap. Instead of snapping at other people, we're going we're gonna, to, it's a different, a better kind of snap. And so here's what it is. The S stands for stop. You're going to practice the pause. David says, wait overnight, give it a night. We're going to stop. And when you're in that meeting, you're in that conversation, you're waiting on hold with customer service, and you can feel your body temperature starting to rise. Before you shout back, before you hit send on that email, before you tap that little green arrow on the text message on your phone, before you give the greatest speech that you're ever going to regret, practice the pause. Stop. And invite the Holy Spirit into that space between the trigger and your response. Because the space between the trigger and your response, that's where your power is. That's where your control is. You're going to invite the Lord into that space to determine where am I going to go with this. And so we stop. And then N is notice. Notice what is going on inside of you. Notice and observe your feelings. You don't need to change your feelings. You don't need to judge your feelings. Just notice them. Just name them. And there's something so powerful about just recognizing, you know what, I'm jealous right now. 
I feel disappointed right now. I feel betrayed right now. I feel impatient right now. As you can name those emotions, neuroscientists tell us that just by naming them and identifying them, it it shifts something powerfully in your brain and it can deactivate uh, circuits in your brain that trigger unhealthy responses just by becoming aware of what's going on. And so we're going to stop, we're going to notice what we're feeling, and then the A is ask three really important questions. Number one, what am I believing right now? Because all of our feelings, whether we recognize it or not, are driven by sometimes subconscious beliefs and convictions. So what am I believing right now? Secondly, is it true? And then here's the third question, it is so powerful. What would my life look like if I believed a different narrative? And what can happen is that you can go from actually the verge of losing it on somebody to actually identifying a lie, declaring the truth, and changing the future by simply stopping, becoming aware of what's happening, reflecting on where it's coming from. And then uh, finally, the P is the word that we're probably all sick and tired of hearing, and that's the word pivot. The word of 2020. But pivot is such a powerful word and picture. And if you think about basketball, if you pick up your dribble in a basketball game, uh, you're stuck. You can't really walk anymore, but you do have the gift of a pivot foot. And once you have identified your pivot foot, now all of a sudden what your pivot foot gives you is it gives you options that now you can begin to, uh, you know, step forward, pivot forward, and you can get the defender on uh, behind you and, you know, pass the ball to the other side of the court. You can pivot back and take a jump shot, but the pivot gives you options. And what you and I have, by the grace of God, is we have a pivot foot. When we start to feel angry, and that's the ability to snap, to stop, to notice what's going on, to dig into it, to ask healthy questions, and then we can choose a healthy response. We can choose a different response response that glorifies God and actually unleashes the healing power of the Holy Spirit into our relationships and our workplaces and our world. So we're going to take control of our anger. And this is so important. Paul actually, the Apostle Paul, years later, hundreds of years later in the New Testament, he quotes this verse that we just read from Psalm 4, verse 4. And I want to read it to you in Ephesians 4, verse 26. He says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. He quotes David. And then he gives us a picture. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. When I read that verse, I think about this pushy vacuum cleaner salesman that came into my house one time. You remember those old, those vacuum cleaner salesmen? This is the worst. And this guy knocked on my door and I opened it just a crack to see who was there. And he literally pushed it open walked into my living room, and in 60 seconds, he had dumped dirt all over my living room floor. Well, we're not going anywhere now. And so he's got the vacuum cleaner out, 37 components of this, you know, $1,000 luxury vacuum cleaner. I'm like, dude, my whole house is hardwood floors. I'm not buying this vacuum cleaner. Can you just get out of here? And he's, you know, look at how amazing this cleans up the mess. I'm like, you created the mess. Like, you threw the dirt on the floor. It took me an hour to get this guy out of my house. And that's Satan. He shows up like that. That might actually have been Satan right there in that moment. I don't know. Incarnate. That was him, as you can tell. I have some issues right here that I got to work out. (laughs) Snap, Brad. With this guy. But that's all the enemy needs is a crack in the door. And anger is the crack in the door. You lose control of your anger, it's the crack in the door. Now he's into the marriage, now he's into the family, now he's into the relationship, now he's into your office, now he is in and he is beginning to influence and create on health and distrust. And, and it's often because we don't know how to control our anger. And so what do we do? Paul says there in Ephesians 4, get rid of all bitterness rage, anger, harsh words, slander. Man, if you're dealing with this stuff today, he says, get rid of it. Get it out of your heart. As well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, here's a vision, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Forgiveness. 
that's the third thing I want to just leave you with today. Number three, trust God to make things right. Trust God to make things right. Let me just talk for a minute about righteous anger. I think in a lot of you know, ways we look and say, well, Brett, I have every right to be angry about this. And you probably do. <laughs> and yet we have to recognize that there's a difference between having reasons to be angry and having the right to lash out to someone in anger. And so righteous anger, we see Jesus demonstrating it in his life. He comes into the temple, he sees how the corruption is there and how the poor are being manipulated and uh, ripped off in the temple. And Jesus, he, you know, acts in righteous anger. And there are some who might look and say, man, Jesus lost his cool. He didn't. Jesus was absolutely under the control of the Holy Spirit every step of the way in not only that experience, but throughout his life. He never sinned even when he was angry. Jesus And I think we can look and there are times in our lives and in our world where it is absolutely appropriate to feel righteous anger. When we see systems, when we see structures, when we see examples of injustice, those are not moments to be apathetic or indifferent. When we see, as we have over the last few years, the sin of racism, when we see people made in the image of God who are being marginalized, who are being disenfranchised, uh, when we see those things happening, there is, there is a purpose to righteous anger. Now here's what is so tricky and here's what is so challenging is that it is very difficult for those of us who are not God to maintain righteous anger over an extended period of time without it becoming anger toward another person or a group of people. And so what I'm afraid happens and has happened to many in our culture is that we start out angry because of an issue, because of a cause that deserves our righteous anger, but now we're just angry. We're just angry at everybody. We're angry at everything. And the difficulty with righteous anger is this. And here's why you need God's help and God's discernment. Because all anger feels righteous in the moment. Doesn't it? I mean, anytime we're angry, man, it's the other person's fault. Can we just talk about traffic for a minute? Traffic. I mean, the other guy is always the idiot. When it comes to traffic, it doesn't matter what happened. How many of you ever been cut off? You're driving down the road. You know, somebody changes lanes. You know, it's just me and Jesus. And my window's down. I'm enjoying the fall weather. I got the worship music going on. You know, just me and Jesus. And then this dude cuts me off, comes into the lane, and all of a sudden it's like, bro, like, you got a mirror for a reason. Did you not see me here? This road does not belong to you. So I'm up on his bumper, just waiting for him to look in the rearview mirror. <laughs> Jerk! Man! Somebody ought to revoke that guy's license. Righteous anger. Now, I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to make some of you angry for a minute, but that's okay because you have this message and you can forgive me. How many of you have accidentally cut somebody off? in traffic. Anybody? Ever you're just changing lanes and you accidentally cut somebody off and you looked both ways. They weren't there the first time you looked. So you're merging over and all of a sudden you hear, you know, and all of a sudden what happens is like, dude, like where's the grace, bro? What is it with people today? Nobody has any grace anymore. Jeez, man. Okay. Like I just made a mistake. I'm a good driver. I don't do this all the time. This is one mistake, man. And he's still the jerk. He's still the idiot. Because what happens in life is that we judge other people by their intentions. Or we judge other people by their actions. We want them to judge us by our intentions. And we forget in the meantime all of the mercy and grace and forgiveness that we have received from God. And so... As you begin to see David here processing this, look at what he says in verse five. Offer sacrifices in the right spirit and trust the Lord. 
He says, pause your worship if you have to. If you're about to lift your hands to sing in a worship service or take communion or, and you recognize that, man, you got anger boiling about something towards somebody, he's like, wait. And before you make that sacrifice, before you worship, stop and get your spirit right. Get the anger out. Get the rage out. Get the bitterness out. And here's the only way to do that. Trust the Lord. Say, Brad, I can't just let them go. You don't understand what they did to me. You don't understand how she hurt me. You don't understand what he said. You're right. I don't. To trust the Lord. That God, I'm going to put this in your hands. And I'm going to trust that you are going to make this situation right. Verse 6, many people say, who will show us better times? Let your face smile on us, Lord. You have given me greater joy than those who have abundant harvests of grain and new wine. Remember, David's in the wilderness. He is running for his life. He's being hunted. When he left Jerusalem, he didn't have days to pack. He had moments. And so they're coming on the palace and all he had time was to like throw some Lunchables in the backpack. So now he's walking through the wilderness. Where is his wine? Where is his grain? It's back in Jerusalem with Absalom. It's back in Jerusalem with all these men who are trying to take his life, who are slandering him, who have betrayed him. But yet in the wilderness, he gets this revelation that the joy is not back there with the wine. The joy is not back there with the grain. The joy is out here in the wilderness as I trust God and receive from him joy. That he's with me here. In this moment. And then verse 8 is so beautiful. What a promise. And I want to leave you with this today. In peace. Everybody say peace. I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. Peace. Peace. Listen. Being consumed with anger is totally exhausting. It will sap all of the life from your soul. It will sap all of the joy from your relationships. You know what the opposite of peace is? There's this interesting phrase that we have when we talk about a storm over the sea, that it's an angry ocean, that those are angry waves. And my mind went to this story in the New Testament, in the life of Jesus, where he's actually in one of those storms where scripture says it was was a violent storm and the waves were angry and the sea was angry and it was hurricane-like winds and his disciples thought they were gonna drown and they wake Jesus up and Jesus stands up and he looks at these angry, violent waves and with a word, peace, He silences it. And some of you, your soul, it's like a storm has been brewing inside of you. Your emotions have been like the angry waves of a sea and a storm. And today, if you would be willing to open your heart, to have the courage to give God your pain, to forgive those who have hurt you, to trust the Lord, to make things right. He is ready to speak peace to your soul. And you will become beautifully like your Savior, Jesus. And I want to just read one more scripture as we close. Look at Jesus, 1 Peter 2. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. And so by his wounds, we are healed. You ready to receive his healing today? Jesus left his case in the hands of God. 
so that you could receive that healing. So that you could leave your case in the hands of God. Trust the one who judges fairly. And if you will, then you will, like Jesus, become a wounded healer. And how many of you know our world could use a few more of those? Let's pray. God, thank you for your forgiveness and your grace. I pray for every single person who's here, who's experiencing this message right now. I pray, God, that you would do a work in our hearts. We live, Lord, in an angry city. We walk streets and interact with people who are hurting, who don't know what to do with the hurt and the pain that they feel. And so, God, I thank you for your healing. I pray that it would flow through this room right now, that you would come and fill each of your sons and daughters with joy, with peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, look at me just for one more moment. We're going to do two things today before we close. We're going to receive God's forgiveness, and then we're going to extend forgiveness to others. Some of you are here today and you desperately need to receive God's forgiveness. And here's what I want to say to you. I got some really good news for you right now. Look at me. God is not angry with you. God's not mad at you. Because Jesus, 2,000 years ago, hung on the cross in all of the wrath of God and the anger of God towards sin that you and I deserved was poured out on Jesus. And now, because of Jesus, God is for you in Jesus. And so he's not angry with you. He's not mad at you. He's waiting for you to just open your heart and experience his grace and his forgiveness to come into a relationship with you. And so I want to invite you to close your eyes at home, all over the room. Close your eyes. Because I want to just give you an opportunity right now to receive the saving grace of Jesus. If you're here and you would say, Brad, my life's not right with God. I'm not walking in a right relationship with God. My anger has led me to sin, or I recognize the bitterness, the separation that I have with God. Right now is an opportunity, and if you're ready to say, Brad, I want to come home into a relationship with the Lord. I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want to give him my sin and receive his grace and his forgiveness. I want to just ask you, wherever you are right now, to lift up your hand. Go ahead, if that's you. Lift up your hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you're at home, I can't see you, but the Lord can. I encourage you to lift up your hand just to reach out to God. Say, God, I need you. Now we're going to pray a prayer together, all of us together. But if you lifted your hand, if you're making this choice, just pray this prayer with us from your heart right now. Come on, let's pray. Say, Jesus, I give you my sin. I give you my anger. I give you my hurt and pain. Heal me. Forgive me. I believe you died in my place. I believe you rose from the dead. I'm ready to follow you. So fill me with your spirit. change my life. Amen. Amen. Can we just celebrate God's forgiveness together?